Hi, I'm Laura. Hey, I'm Stefan, and you're listening to Attributed, a podcast library by Dream Data. The purpose of it is to store and share all the knowledge that we have gathered across Dream Data employees through our LinkedIn Lives, podcasts, and webinars. The typical topics you'll find here can be stuff like marketing, sales, B2B ads, operations, social selling, maybe. Hello, hello, everybody. This time with Ling directly over to you from OneFlow. So nice to meet you, Ling, after the summer holidays. Nice to meet you too, Laura. So good to see you again. Likewise. While we're chatting, I'm just checking in real quick if everything is going live because I did get a message that we are live, but I just want to make sure that we are actually live. But while we're doing that, Ling, could you give us a quick intro to yourself, a little bit of your previous history and like not too much, but about branding? Really How is it that you're working out with it? And how, what are you responsible for at OneFlow? Sure. So I, I can start with like, you know, I've been a marketer all my life. I had a, my little agency, you can say, 20 years ago and, you know, selling ideas, um, trying to make people feel like, you know, you can you can be successful through, um, you know, your own ideas and as long as you package it right. And then after that, I've just been, you know, moving along the marketing career ladder, if you like. And today I'm the chief brand officer at OneFlow and I take care of or our content in-house agency creative team, if you like. And as of yesterday, we're eight people in the team. So I have, yeah, a lot of people who work with brand and content and communications. That's a lot. And when I think about OneFlow, there is one more than one but there's a key thing that sticks in my mind is how you're working with the visuals the content great but the visuals are something that is really attracting the eye and every time i see the visual i sometimes don't even need to see the logo but i'm able to recognize that this is created by you and the team so kudos for that it's really really nice everybody should go and check it out how good they are at that so today we're going to talk about branding, chief branding officer. You don't hear that that much just yet, but we're going to talk everything about branding. How does it matter in the company for the growth? How can you measure it? What kind of team do you need to execute it in the right way as well? So Ling, in your books, walk us through what is a B2B company branding for you? <laughs> I, I mean, I like to steal people's idea and I do that, you know, quite proudly as well. And I'd like to put together a definition of brand from um, Jeff Bezos and Seth Godin. So Jeff Bezos defined brand as, you know, something that people say or think about you when you're not in the room. And then Seth Godin would say, you know, it's something that influences their decision to, I'm sorry, my, my dog, for, uh, by the way, um, Seth Godin. <laughs> Seth Godin said that, you know, brand is something that influences their choices to choose you, um, to, to purchase you. And I think within the B2B setting, that is very relevant because with the pace of innovation today, um, any it's easy to, you know, build a software, an application yeah. or something that, you know, it's easier today than ever. And so if any good, if you have a really great feature and you start you know, um, compete in the in the race of, you know, who has the best feature. Um, surely a great competitor will, you know, copy you or, you know, make it better. And so brand to me is something that, you know, is the assets that we can control to influence that decision to choose you rather than a substitute. So this is very interesting. And by the way, so in your experience, how much have you been working with B2Cs and B2Bs? We could tip In my around. experience, yeah. yep. So when we had our own agency, so I co-founded an agency together with my uncle. So we have maybe 50% B2C customers and B2B. And then after my career started, maybe like 20, 20 years ago, 19 years ago, and there has been B2B within a certain specific industry as well within document automation industry until today. So if you don't know what OneFlow does, OneFlow automates um, contracts of so turning paper manually 
handled contracts into digital contracts. So, so I've been in this industry for too many years. So interesting. And, and that's, that's kind of a little bit of a flow into why I've asked the question about B2B versus B2C, because right. in B2Cs, it's kind of, the bar is very high to what branding is, but it's mm -hmm. kind of easy to hit as well. Like be a little different, the colors and so on. It's like really, really heavy on the purchase. Why? The packaging and so on. But when you move into something so boring as contract, uh, flow automation and stuff like that. I was like, okay, how do you brand that one? So yeah. how, how do you look at branding for B2Bs for something that's not so exciting? So you don't just write on features, but you do stand out as a, as a brand. What yeah. are your thoughts around it? Right. Maybe I'm very different. Maybe I'm very weird. I'm, maybe I'm such a nerd, but I love B2B. I, I think contracts are super boring. It's very unsexy. And so the bar is actually quite low for you to make it sexy. So in my opinion, it's easier to work with B2B branding than a B2C branding because the bar is so low. All you need is to be, you know, to be ballsy. Yeah, 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 yeah. <laughs> and then of course, I mean, jokes aside, I think it's important to understand what you actually deliver in your product. So um, our vision is, to, you know, say contract think one flow. So we want to be able to, um, have in the future, people think about when people think about contracts, they think about one flow. So what we actually essentially doing with our branding is that to create that mental shortcuts to mm -hmm. contracts, whenever they, they see us, you know, like whenever they have a touch point with one flow. And um, what we want to say with our brand is that, you know, um, the experience with contracts can be so really negative and so yeah. Um, tedious, messy, complicated, long, um, wordy, and the experience is very boring and very administrative. And what we really want to show is that our product what can turn that experience around so that it feels like magic. And and I think that is essentially the message that our brand gives. It's not just I don't want it to. I know it, it looks very cool, it's very pretty, but it's not just that. Like, and that is not the most important thing. The most important thing is that it has a connection to what you actually do. Yeah. And a lot of times, our visuals are very much, you know, I would say a bit more premium than the rest. Mm -hmm. It's mm -hmm. kind of, it's very um, retouch. It's very detailed and it's very like well thought through. And, and the reason is because contract is such a sensitive document as well. And so people don't actually just let you take care of the contracts, rather they have to trust you. They have to understand that, well, we actually have the machine behind you to support such an important documents. So all these little cues that we have in our visual is to represent that security, to represent you know the safety of, you can trust us with us because we're, you know, we feel, you know, I hope I hope that it does, and that it feels you know secure. I don't know. I was just looking at them. This thing called peacock effect. I don't uh -huh, know. If you know uh -huh. Yeah, yeah. So when a male peacock, you know, when they see a female, that they're like, "This is so stupid." I don't know why I'm doing this live. Oh, come on. <laughs> and uh, they will show off their feathers, right? Yeah. And to me, that is something. Um, that is something that brand can you know try to do as well. You know, right. like. If you show that peacock effect and and you would understand that oh hey um that is actually you know um you know not just attract you to your audience but also to give that feeling perception that um you're actually more serious than you know another person without that peacock feathers this is a very very interesting correlation of ideas because what i would like to do right now for everybody who's listening to us live, imagine how a contract automation website would look like, or at least what is it that people would be expecting to see. And when I close my eyes, I see squarey forms and like very detailed website because I'm never a buyer. And I will be showing your website right now, I just prepared it just to quickly scroll through it, how different that is, because what you're talking about is like, let me go to this at ease. Contracts don't have to be neither boring, but they're going to be 
taking care of the company who cares about the quality, but also cares about the seriousness of contracts as well. So this, all this parallel gives an understanding for me how much you have invested into understanding your customers, understanding the use cases, and how serious they're taking that specific topic. Let me share your my screen just for one second, because I think it's really, really worth it. Have a look. So now we are at the website for contracts. Like you both have the ease of the website. The colors are amazing. The retouch, as you're saying, it's like we did not just do it on, I don't know, mid journey or just created click and go, whatever other software. But this is, I think this is amazing. Can you walk us through how did you work with branding when you started at OneFlow and how are you working with that right now? Right. So, um, first of all, we have a great team and we also have a really good agency and uh, you can, you can message me if you want to know the name of the agency. I totally recommend them. And what, what happens is that we always start with insights. Um, survey, customer survey, as you said, you know, a good marketer is someone who obsess about the customer. That's it. There's nothing else. You should be obsessed about the customers. And the same thing with branding. We want to start with insights. Um, we did surveys with our customers. We did surveys with our employees at that time. Um, and also surveys from our partner community, uh, making sure that we capture everything um, that they are um, thinking about in terms of contracts, in terms of, you know, how they experience other others, other solutions and stuff like that, and bring that ideas and themes into our, our brand. And so the, the, the main red thread that we found from all these insights is that um, the, it's, it's what I just explained, you know, like how contracts are always associated with something messy, complicated, and they wish that, you know, there was the magic wand that would just, you know, turn that all around because all you want is to get a contract signed. All you want is to come to an agreement that everyone has agreed to the contract without a lot of, you know, going back and forth in your email threads or trying to call somebody, trying to make sure that I send the right version, um, trying to make sure that all the correspondence, correspondence within the conversation when you are negotiating are in one place, making sure that, you know, that stakeholder has the right version. And, you know, all these things are just frictions. Yeah. And that's why we want to remove all that. And we put that into our messaging, you know, fighting frictions, providing clarity so that you can work better and uh, using the contract data to make better decisions. Really, really cool. And Carolina has a question that is so relevant here. I'm not sure if that's too deep, but let's cover it a little bit. So when you send out question surveys to your prospects or your users, what were the questions that were important for you to cover to understand how do they perceive the problem in the branding? Oh, sure. Absolutely. Then, then you would un you would try to un understand from the perspective of the customer how to experience it. So for our our um example would be you know how how do you normally sign contracts how do you normally create contracts how do you normally store contracts and we want to make sure that um we think about the terminology to use so there are like 20 different questions i would say um that talks around the space that you're operating in just to understand you know the way they would use the product versus the way they if they didn't have the product how would they go about it uh huh, and the surveys are those filled out, or something you take it. Oh, in one okay. Conversation. So basically, just online survey, and then we did like quantitative interviews as well, um, and then also um, also um, executive survey. So just interviews with executive. How do you see one flow in five years time? 10 years time, nice. um, and um, yeah, and then we did a follow up. So we're actually planning something really exciting. And so you're going to see that more, um, you know, in a, in a couple of months, I would say. And, um, and we did follow up and see, like, you know, has that really changed your perception about contracts? When you think about contracts, what do you think? When you think about OneFlow, what do you think? So our responses has been super fun because a lot of people are associating one flow with rabbits nowadays. Yeah, me too. Which is typical. 
<laughs> you should bring them to conferences the next time you go. Yes. And when we launched the brand, we actually have a live rabbit um, calling in from Zoom. Uh -huh. And uh, to to really, you know, make that feel of, oh, it's magic, you know. Exactly. But, uh, oh, very exciting. <laughs> I'm looking forward to that. Talking about conferences, another note, like how your brand goes through. This is from my experience of what I have seen working. So one of the things that Ling and the team was giving out at conferences was straws mm -hmm. with one flow brand. And it's like one flow and a straw in the mind. It even connects. It was so perfect. So we can cover the events and preparation a little further. We have so much to cover. And Stephanie has another question in terms of mm -hmm. a little bit towards the survey questions. But how about benchmarking? Do you use benchmarking for your branding as well? Benchmarking, I guess, you know, how do we how do we measure the success of the brands? What do you mean by benchmarking? I would guess, Stephanie, if you could rewrite the question a little bit more precise, then we will cover that one. I have my guess, but I think it's not to do with measurement. Okay. We'll cover that. So let's move on to our agenda. So how does brand amplifies all the other efforts in marketing and where does it go further than marketing? Walk me through. Right. So you talk about B2C, right, in the beginning, and they always come up with new visuals, new ideas, new concepts, and um, they use it for, you know, sponsor pros, um, their ads and stuff like that. And and to me, I feel like, you know, the same way we would use our brand to with different visuals to to improve the performance marketing side of things. So making sure that, you know, the the click through rate is uh, higher, the cost is cheaper per click and um, and then the same thing with conversion, letting people stay on the website more because they feel a bit curious. And so they would scroll and then we can have more opportunities to, um, to be with them. And that's one thing. So performance marketing, the other part of course is sales effectiveness. If someone has heard about OneFlow before, then it makes cold calling easier. Um, you don't have to explain from scratch, you know, what it does. And, and so, and also when I would say like, um, a topic opener like we we normally would have people commenting about website and no. we get you know feedback from sales like oh this customer really like our website um and then of course talent um oh, yeah. attraction yeah. how do you have people want to feel like you know proud about working at one flow and wanted to be at one flow um have that pride in them you know i'm yeah. proud to wear one flow um, I want to represent OneFlow and that's important, you know, and that, you know, the pride within our team is something that will help company grow. I really believe in that. If you feel really proud about working for, for, for a company, then you would feel like you own it. And if you have that ownership mentality, you'll be able to find new ways, new innovative, creative ways to sell the product, to you know, reach out to prospects. Um, how can I make sure I get more leads? You know, that kind of stuff. So I really feel like, you know, it all stems into that pride and that's how I see brand will affect, you know, the entire organization. I love that. And besides the website that is obviously amazing, where does your brand flow through then? Yes. Yeah, so all the digital channels that you can measure and you can't measure so events i guess and then um social media platform of course and and also from hopefully our employees and um, mm -hmm. they you know do their own social media posts as well um within the company the brand is super strong we try to make sure that the office feels one flow um a lot of times you know even the little cups you know we would have um, opinions on like this doesn't look one flow or the chair or, oh, I mean it's so detailed and even fashion sense you know like you know oh this material doesn't feel one flow but this does or you know are you wearing that color code for you know for Wednesday you know that kind of stuff yeah so it's, wow. it's really part of us and even I realized myself decorating my house with the same colors as I do at work <laughs> <laughs> that's above and beyond, I would say. This is really cool, but the colors are nice as well. So that's, that's, 
even when I watch some of the pictures from your office on social media and so on, it really does feel as one brand. It's like as if that website has moved into the Stockholm office. It's amazing. It's like That's cool. absolutely great. Yes. Um, let's talk about control of your branding and what we mentioned at the agenda was that branding is the only asset that you can control. How do you feel about that? What else can you control as a marketer besides branding? Can you? <laughs> I would only say it's your brand. It's just a reputation that you can control in a sense. Um, I mean, a lot of channels that we use are not owned by us. Your own, you can control your own website for sure, yeah. um, but you can't really control um, competitors, you know, going ahead of you you know they have more funding they have you know they're they have better people i don't know um which is weird like why wouldn't they want to work at one club but anyway the pace of innovation is so fast right now and then also the markets external market factors are dynamic they're changing all the time changing is the only thing constant but what is what will not change is what you believe your values your the things that hold your people together, the things that hold the company together, the made up of your DNA and within the company. And that is your brand. You know, brand is really the DNA of your company. It's not, it's not built by me. It's not built by my team. It's built through all the people within the company in some way or another. We pull that, you know, themes from everybody, um, customers around us, surrounding the company. And that is what makes the brand. And it's the only thing you can control because you can control who you hire into the company, yeah. right? And you can control how your product will be, you know, heading in terms of direction. But you can't really control everything else, in my opinion. Yeah, I absolutely am with you on this one. It's like you can control this part and then a lot of things are having the ripple effects out of your branding. But it is so difficult to grasp because as you're saying, branding is not your website. Branding no. is not what you put on the walls at the company office. It's it it goes all over. So it's it's good job by building up something people can remember. There were even people commenting that when I think of documents and contract management, I think of OneFlow. It's like, oh, really? Oh, nice. Yes. Exactly. <laughs> Why wouldn't you? Happy. Yeah. So the, now we're going to move into the topic of measurement. And just <laughs> to go directly head in to that topic, Morton has a question. That's your that topic. That's no, your no, topic. It's going to be over to you. No, it's <laughs> your topic. So how do you measure or attribute value from the various channels? Is there one or two channels that you have found works better for branding versus sales? Like kind of how do you all in all measure branding? Oh, it's so difficult. It's like a never ending question. I think we just have to accept that some of the channels are just not measurable and the channels keeps growing and it keeps expanding and you can't just be like measuring one channel and make that decision based off on one measurement. It's like you said yesterday, was it? Well, you were, had, had a little rant. Monday rant, yes. <laughs> Monday rant, it's difficult. We measure, you know, the, the typical stuff, you know, like brand related searches, um, direct traffic, um, social media traffic, you know, that kind of stuff. Um, sales cycle, is it go growing over time or is it shortening over time? You know, that kind of stuff. But it's so difficult, I mean, I don't really have the answer for that rather but than let's you know, put it the other way then. Yeah. Um, if you were to convince the C level mm -hmm. that we need to do some updates with branding, not just improve our paid or organic or whatever it is that you can actually measure at least more. Yeah. What would you say? Well, luckily we do have a CMO at OneFlow. <laughs> who does all the calculations and and so brand is really part of the marketing um spend of course mm -hmm. and then we try to make sure that when we do our calculation that it's also in, included into the spend i would say it's about the, a split of 60 40 like in terms of you know brand ads marketing ads that kind of stuff um it has to be both I know that at one time we accidentally, well, I accidentally turned off our brand um, marketing ads, so brand ads 
And that affected our sales ads um, immediately. So sales ads is more like conversion ready, you know, like um, you click on that, we know that you're gonna convert. Yeah. But then it's more like, you know, reaching out to the demand that, or the people that you don't normally reach out to. Um, and so without the, you know, the, the brand ads, we also get less leads. So we have to so work hand in hand. And that was a mistake, like an honest mistake. We didn't understand it was turned off until we realized the lead has gone down. And then when we start to investigate it, then we realize, oh shit, it was because that was, you know, off. And and so that allows us to feel confidence that, you know, yeah. they need to be hand in That's hand. That's a very expensive test, but <laughs> also very interesting to see the results as well because if you wouldn't have accidentally done this you would always not really know and would just have a hunch it's kind of working we just don't know how much yes. it impacts yes. this yes. is really cool yeah and i guess you can always like you know um yeah someone is measuring share of search too yeah um, and, and yes. that is something that okay. we try to measure in 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 the past um and we still do we still do that we get the help from google to help us to do this but we realize that we're so small like in this world of contract automation oh. that it doesn't really move you know over the quarter from one quarter to another so yeah. i think you have to be like you know super big in b2c you know automotive kind of industry in order to see that moving um yeah. so we do get we still measure it but we don't i don't really see how i can make decision based on that no. Yeah. Especially for the side. I agree with you for the size of the, like how much you take off of all yes. of the stuff that's happening with documents. Stephanie has clarified the question a little bit. So in terms of what we have been speaking about, how to do benchmarks and prepare for customer interviews for branding, how much do you look into competitive alternatives, your customers, prospects you have and mm -hmm. who you're competing with really? So talk me through about competition versus your brand how much does that affect of what you do right so in the beginning when we did like customer surveys partners um market survey that kind of stuff interviews we also of course look at look at competitors and how they look like and then we try to identify based on you know our competitors what colors are they using what kind of identity they possess or yeah. what kind of brand archetype they are and what do we want to be but I would say, you know, that is just a part, like a supporting, a complement part. You should always be yourself and not be affected, you know, by, you know, the opportunities presented because the competitors are not there. Um, because ultimately, if you, if, if we're, you know, being persuaded or being like swayed in terms of decision making um, based on what competitors presented as opportunities, then maybe it would work in the short term, but in the long run, if you have to pretend to be someone else, it's not gonna work, right? Mm -hmm. So it has to be authentic. And luckily our DNA is, you know, equals the opposite of what our competitors are. <laughs> I would agree. It's and and I think in the larger companies, if you have a lot of budget, people do like research and stuff like that, you know, like brand indexing and yeah. We don't have that kind of budget, so <laughs> we don't do that. But rather, you know, we would try to do surveys within yeah. our customers. And uh, Martin has actually added another question to follow up on the measurement topic. Due to the mistake that you did turning off the branding searches and all the paid media and that, what's your take on gut feeling measurements? Because this is where you're taking us right now, saying that, oh, our competitors are doing it like this. We don't have a budget to do all of those huge surveys. How much of your gut do you feel and how do you actually figure out is like, is it working? I mean, I really want to say that, you know, I totally believe in data driven um, measurements. Like I really want to us to be on that level, like data driven decisions making. Um, it has to be based on data. Um, at the same time, you know, like if you don't, I mean, the risk of not, spending money on brand is much higher than mm -hmm. the risk of spending it. That's my take on it. Yep. There's another question, which is very interesting. We did not touch on this one. Do you do and measure impact of brand leasing, like collaborating with joint campaigns with stronger popular brands to help you amplify your own? 
I mean, we do we do collaboration in a sense with the partners um, where their products are integrated with our products. We don't measure because of the collaboration from branding per se, but we do measure the impact of you know the campaigns itself. Yeah, yeah. And of course, like I'm paired with you, Laura. Of course, my brand is gonna go up when I'm paired with you. You know that kind of stuff. So your yeah. brand is as important for me that as you know as it is for i mean i'd rather choose you than someone else that you know could have booked me for the same time for a live linkedin unless <laughs> it's a client <laughs> then you don't say no of course i cannot say no to you like what thank you so much <laughs> one more question before we wrap up, if you are in the audience, if you've got more questions, we can definitely couple, uh, cover a couple more, but this is the final one on my list. So how did you get me here that I'm so excited about your brand and how do you get everybody else pumped about your brand at one flow link or anywhere else? I don't know. I don't know about you, but we, I can start with, you know, within the company. And I think this is because you know, you love hearing your name, Laura, right? And and the same the same way brand would work with people because um, what I see is that our brand is so exciting for everybody. It's because it comes from them. Um, the, it all started with insights. It starts, started with surveys, you know, their answers, their responses, you know, their words. And so it comes from them. So what we're just trying to do, you know, within marketing is to, amplify the the words the ideas that they already have you mm -hmm. know through the insights that we collect from I mean, interviews and surveys and so when it's presented they feel proud because it came from them even though subconsciously and that's why i think it's important to to always start with insights start with data and then work from there and, and because we're so different in the sense that we really, truly uh, capture the weirdness of us, because we're all weird, but sometimes we're not, we're not open about exposing our, our weirdness because, you know, it's, it's scary, right? Yeah. And so I think our brand is bold in the sense that we, we expose the weirdness in us and then all of a sudden, maybe you're with yourself too, Laura. And then you, and then you, you be like, "What? This feels like, you know, something that you can't really, you can't really say in word, but then it catches your attention. Yeah. Because yeah. somehow there is some kind of weirdness in you. And I think in our brand, we work a lot with, you know, tensions, conflicts. Yeah. Um, contracts are boring. Contracts are messy. And so we try to make our brand feels easy, feels clean. And, and that conflicts are always very exciting to spark curiosity. Right. And, and so that is also another, yeah, another thing that we have in mind when we try to work for our brand. When I put, like, try to make some words about your brand from what I've seen, for me, it's mostly the website and what I've seen at events of the way you present yourself. It's imperfectly perfect. Because your website is absolutely perfect. In my eyes, it's like very aesthetic, really perfect. But at the same time, you do amplify that part that there is some imperfection in that part due to what type of people do we choose to put on our website? How are we choosing to present ourselves at the conferences and so on. But then again, the stuff you're giving out, the stuff you're wearing goes into the perfection as well because you, you wouldn't wear whichever hoodie. I know that. <laughs> <laughs> yes, absolutely. Cool. Um, yeah, Morton has a comment exposing that weirdness make one flow really real. And that I, I absolutely understand that. Um, <laughs> Yeah, it's a very business professional, but customer doesn't know who the people really are. I love it. Thank you for that. And yes, Dale absolutely. has a comment for you as well, saying that one full website is Aww. stunning. Ling, you're doing a great Thank job. You. Kudos for everybody who's watching you. All right. So if you've got any further questions, Ling, where can people catch you and have a further chat about branding or contracts? On LinkedIn, for sure. <laughs> Connect with Ling on LinkedIn. <laughs> Great. Thank you so much, Ling, for coming over to this session. 
first one of the summer holidays and see you at another event we're meeting again. Yes, thank you so much, Laura. And thank you, everybody, for your attention. Thank you so much. I appreciate it. See you, everybody. We hope you like listening to us. Subscribe to our podcast and the ones that we have been guests on. And if you have any feedback for us, uh, just do let us know. And should there be a guest that you think we should be talking to, then like pitch us. We're looking forward to seeing you.